succeeded. Let us pray together. Father of glory, give us your Holy Spirit. The Spirit of wisdom, of revelation of all that is holy. Give us the Spirit of your Son, that sacred power living within us. Give us your Holy Spirit that we might be sons and daughters, the heirs of your kingdom. Amen. Today is referred by those of us in this particular line of work. It's referred to as Satan Sunday. Every first Sunday in Lent, we get the same or one similar kind of passage. And I wondered uh, about the woman who husband all the time got drunk and she decided one day she was going to cure him of this particular habit. So she went and rented a devil's suit all red with horns and fork tail and a pitchfork. And she waited behind the tree outside of the pub until her husband stumbled out one night, and as he was walking along the path, she jumped out at him with the pitchfork at ready and said, I am going to take your soul. And he said, Who are you? I'm the devil. He said, Well, you might as well come with me because I married your sister 36 years ago. Another man, um, he had died, he, he had done so well, and he went to the place of torment, who was being escorted to where he was going by the devil, and he smelled all the sulfur, and saw all the boiling cauldron of lava, and and saw the pit where he was going to be put, and heard the screaming of people. And then he saw a man sitting over in the corner that he recognized to be an attorney. And next to him, he had the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen, and he was just up nuzzling her. And he said to the devil, he said, Hey, look. Why is it that I've got to go burn for eternity when that guy I know is an attorney is sitting next to the most beautiful woman I've ever seen? And the devil said, shut up. Who are you to judge her punishment? And I hear from the attorneys afterwards. And Satan Sunday. The adversary, many names. And some of us in the 21st century have difficulty. This is a stumbling block text that we never seem to get beyond because we believe it's talking about some kind of superstitious character. I looked on the History Channel. They had that history of Satan. And it was interesting the way Satan had been depicted through art. Did you know there was a time when Satan was portrayed as being blue? About a hundred year window there. Because some theologians said there's no light in hell, and without light it was really cold, so the devil's skin was blue. We also learned that many, many ancient religions had their own character for devil, and they had their own minions doing their work for them. And for those of us who feel that we have progressed beyond superstition, about all this Sunday is good for is to listen to some very old and trite 
jokes. Well, there is also an opposite camp. And that camp takes the devil very seriously because they see the devil in everything they see in the world. The devil is hiding behind every bush, lurking in every shadow, ready to jump out and get on them. There are some churches you might walk in and they have a garbage can so you can spit out the devil, cast it out into the garbage can. After all, we wouldn't want a demon to litter our carpet, would we? And somewhere, I wonder if the two of them do not take lightly, too lightly, this passage in our gospel. Both extremes seem to deny the power of evil, the radical evil in our lives. It has been called by many names. Entropy is one name. The winding down of all things. The falling apart. The decay. And that has been called. Entropy has been called the same as being one with the devil. Some might call it chaos. We follow a God of order. Thus chaos. Random movement of things with no real purpose. That has been called the source of evil. You remember the Star Wars movies? The Dark Side? Art, Vader, very similar to a Jungian idea of the shadow, and even Freud, who became a religion within himself, has this one part that he defines as being the mortito drive within every human being, the death drive. Swiss theologian Karl Barth calls it Das Nichtige, the, the nothing, the nothingness that is something. And often quoted in this book, but Paul Tillich calls it the fear of non being. We come to a point of feeling that life is meaningless. Isn't it? The best communicator of them all to describe what is going on in our text is, I think, C.S. Lewis. A zoo of lust, bubble of ambition. It is a nursery of fears, a harem of fondled hatreds. And their name is Legion. A theology which does not take seriously evil is no more than some return to a utopian philosophy. It is one part of utopia in it and a kind of reckless idealism in it. And what we learn from our passage it is outside of us, it is inside of us, within us. No matter what we call it, arose by any other name. And the purpose is to destroy the meaningfulness of life. To make our life come unglued at the hinges. learned from this text this morning is that the power of evil always attacks us in our weaknesses. Forty days Jesus has fasted. That means whenever you see in biblical literature, it's not literalism, it means a long, long time. 
is used up all the fuel of his body, his glycogen stores are gone, he has no more fat deposits on which to draw fuel, his muscles are suddenly and slowly being destroyed. This temptation for him comes when he is most weak. And I know personally this to be true. Isn't it always that way with us? Temptation comes when we are the weakest. Achilles, the mythological character, the great warrior of all Greece, his mother was said to have dipped him in the river Styx in hopes to make him immortal. And she held him by the heel of his foot. He was impervious to arrows and spears. They would just bounce off of him. Until one day in the Battle of Troy, he is hit with a stray arrow right in his, what we call, Achilles tendon. And there he bled to death. Socrates says an unexamined life is not worth living. Have you examined your life about your weaknesses? Some of you struggle with fear. Some with anger. Some feel that they don't have any self-confidence. Some struggle with chemical dependencies or unhealthy sexual attitudes. If you find that you do not have an Achilles heel, then one of two things has happened. You are living an unexamined life or your problem is pride. Whether temptation comes from outside of us or within us, it always will come as a deception. Jesus says, I mean, Satan says to Jesus, Turn this stone into bread and eat it. Bow down to me, and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. I know. Throw yourself off the pinnacle of the temple into the valley below, and you will be held up by the angels, so you will not dash your foot against the stone. It's easy for us Christians to turn down at first take radical evil, though we see it for what it is. We don't want to murder. We don't want to steal. But what's wrong with eating a little bread? What's wrong? Jesus, and turning that stone into something you can eat and get regain your strength. After all, you are starving, aren't you? Is it wrong to be proud of your own country? No, it is a good thing. But where we become vulnerable to the lie is when our national pride turns into nationalism and our approach to other countries as long as they can benefit our country by imperialism, then it is wrong. Is it wrong to have a strong faith? No. But when our expression of our faith excludes 
stop the temptation blindsides us. Maybe if we could just stop and utter a prayer. Greater are you who is in me than the one in the world. The Lord's Prayer, we say it as part of our liturgy, but it was not intended in its original intent to be a prayer that we say over and over. It was to be a guide for our prayer life. And there's a portion in there you might want to remember, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let us not leave here today without that remembrance of very special gift that is your legacy. And I conclude with something perhaps you've heard, but it is so on point. Man was talking about my life. My life is as if two dogs are inside of me, and it's a dog fight. A dog fight. There's this good dog, and then there's this bad dog. And his friend asked him, well, which one wins? And he said, the one I feed the most. The one I feed the most. May we, during this Lenten season, feed on the body, the blood of Christ, and pray for Christ indwelling Holy Spirit when temptation comes. Greater is he who is in me 